Sometimes we dig into um, a very, I think, very simple message, but one that causes us to reflect um, on, on where we're at spiritually. God, we ask, Lord, you've given us the church, you've given us um, this group of people, these, the, these people around us, and I pray, Lord, that as we look in your word and see what is the church meant to do, what is some quality about the church that we're not, we're, we're not practicing or that we're missing, God, that we consider, where do, where do I fit in that? And so let's be your time, God, and speaking to us, we pray that we have receptive hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so I have a simple question for you. Let's start with this. Turn to somebody and answer this. What do you want to be known for? What do you want to be known for? All right, so go ahead and take some time. Think about that for a second. What do you want to be known for? When you, when you have this question, and this question comes to mind, right, you, uh, obviously, a, a bunch of adjectives uh, then come pouring out. A bunch of descriptors about who you are, about how you hope others would want to know who you are, right? And this description about you, these adjectives about you, really impact uh, and affect uh, a lot about your behavior. In fact, who I want other people to know, or what I want other people to know about me, impacts the way that I interact on social media. What I post on social media first comes through my filter of what I want you to think about me, right? What I, uh, the way I act with you guys and the way I talk with you guys comes through this filter of what I want you to think about me. Uh, a lot of the way that I, I interact, the way that I hide from you and what I hide from you, Right? What I don't want you to know about me is impacted what, about how I want you to feel me and how I want you to see me. The way that my feelings are impacted uh, is, or, or the way I feel is impacted by how I want to be known. Right? So the list can go on and on about this impact about how you want to be known really has far-reaching implications on who you are. So. What do you want to be known for, right? I wish I had time to talk to, about, to each of you about this. This is a really good question. So uh, I guess I'll start, and then starting with the people in the back, the microphones will come on up, and no, I'm kidding, we, won't, we don't have time for all that. Um, my, uh, if I was to, to answer this question, um, I'll start with this. I was the only Asian kid in my elementary school, right? The whole elementary school, a few hundred people, right? The only Asian kid. And that, um, uh, I, I also was not particularly good at music or math, as you think that, that, that you know your local Asian Chinese kid should be, uh, and I wasn't particularly smart. So uh, growing up, I I I didn't uh, make friends very easily. I kind of was you know bullied a little bit in elementary school. Who wasn't right? We all kind of were a little bit, and um, um, kind of had moments of feeling alone. Everyone go oh. <laughs> yes, that's healing for me. Um, <laughs> and uh, I found refuge in church, actually. I had a lot of friends in church, and, and uh, the youth group, when I became a youth, ended up uh, feeling that acceptance and love from church, as churches should be, right? And, uh, and because of that, I think that gave a positive reflection of church and Jesus and faith to me. And so I wanted to be known, especially growing up, uh, to be known as a person who like was a person of faith and also a person of wisdom. There was an experience as a young young adult where I, I would really ponder things and like give well thought out answers and people would say, Wow, that's really wise and you're really wise. You know? I'm like, I'm really wise, cool, right? I want to be known as a person who's wise. So that's me. And I, I think about that. If you were to share with everybody here what are your top two or three descriptions or adjectives about what you want to be known for, what would it be? Um, when people think about you, do they say, well, she, she's, she's so beautiful. Is that what you want people to think of? Is that she's so, right, happy? That she's so independent? That she's strong-willed? Is that what you want people to think of you, ladies? That you're competent? Maybe that you're a good cook? That you're loving? That you're the life of the party? What is it? How about guys, right? What is it the guys generally want people to think about them? Is it that, that you're a good father? Is it that you're funny? Or you're going places, you know? That guy is like, he is going to be successful in the future. Is it that he's friendly or a nice guy? Is it that he, he doesn't need anybody? He's strong and independent and he can do it on his own. What do you want people to know about you? It's a really good question, isn't it? 
the adjectives that you have about yourself. So it is important to realize what people want to know about you, but here's an even more important question. What happens when you do not measure up to the standard that you self set for yourself? What happens when you don't meet this expectation of, that you push out, that you project out to other people? What happens when people start to look at you and get to know you and see something maybe doesn't you know, completely add up to this projection of yourself? What happens when people see that you're contradictory? What happens when people are a little disappointed in the real you? What do you do? Now, if you're like me, I actually already know what you already do. Because if you're like me, you, you do a couple things. You start to pretend. You start to hide, right? You, you maybe start to cover or make excuses for yourself. Or you start to say, listen, you need to stop talking about me and letting Pastor Chris know about me or you letting them know about me or letting whatever. You, you need to cover for me more. You start to cover for yourself or you start to blame others for not covering for you. When we miss the mark of our own expectations of who we are projecting out around ourselves, we need to all of a sudden get a lot of energy, right, and a lot of work to manage our image. Do you know what I'm talking about? We have to, we need to begin to manage our image, right? You might say uh, your, your actions start to be different. You start to maybe not show up in certain spaces. You might say, you know, I'm going to stay home today because I don't want people to judge me. You start to act differently. You start to talk differently. You start to, you got to manage that image. So when we're not measuring up on the inside from what we're projecting on the outside, you become, get this, this is kind of harsh truth, okay? You don't mean to, but all of a sudden you become an imaginary person. <laughs> what do you mean by that? I mean by, by this. The real you is on the inside, and the only person that people know of you is the one that you pushed on the outside. And they're two different people. It's fabricated. And here's the problem with that. We think we can kind of get away with that, but we can't really get away with it. Because the problem with that is it's impossible to have genuine, deep relationships with people who are not actually people. You can't have a real relationship with an imaginary person. You're only relating to the image of that person that they're giving you instead of the real person. Does that make sense? It gets even worse than that, okay? It gets even worse than that. The moment that we be, begin to pretend, the moment that we present only our best selves and this image of ourselves instead of our real selves, we stop growing. Here's what I mean by that. When we, right, we invest a whole lot of energy and time in managing that image into making sure that we look good instead of actually taking care of the substance and, and caring, taking care of the character and taking care of the real person inside. And when we do that, we stop maturing, we stop getting better, we stop getting, you know, getting wiser. Now here's the thing, we think that uh, if we're just getting older, we're getting better. But that's simply not the truth. How many of you know somebody, don't raise your hand, how many of you know somebody that they're like they're in their 30s, but they're, they act like they're still like that single guy in their 20s when he was the, like the life of the party, right? Don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How many of you guys, right? You know, like you, spiritually, you're still stuck from decades ago, from years ago. Even though you might be older, it's like, oh man, that guy needs to grow up. That girl needs to grow up. How many of you know that woman, don't know her? The mother of a preteen, right? Who still wants to be acknowledged for how pretty she is. From when she got all those compliments back when she was single. Right? <laughs> Here's the point where people are like, Pastor Chris, what are you talking about? Don't talk to me about me, right? I'm not talking about you, dude. Let's talk about other people. Um, if you're relying on your success from your past, you're stuck. 
You're stuck from actually becoming and growing and being transformed into the person God is making and calling you in the future. So, listen, that sounds really judgmental. Like, Chris, you're really judgmental. I'm not trying to be judgmental. Um, because uh, I'm actually talking about myself, too. I understand very well how to be a pretender. <laughs> be an imaginary person. I would probably, I could make a really good argument that pastors excel at this better than anyone. Right? Uh, think about it, right? Now, in your situation, you don't want to lose respect from your children, so you have to make, you know, put your best foot forward in front of your children, in front of your mom, or your dad, or your teachers, or that little girl at school, whatever, right? So you get, you feel that pressure, right? But for pastors, we are professional Christians, right? We are paid to somehow have this really integritous life, where the, our inside and our outside match perfectly. Like, we're, 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 it's supposed to have it all together that somehow our feet don't actually touch the ground. We kind of float around a few inches off the ground and kind of come to you and say, well, just kind of get your life together and all will be well, right? Like me. And so we have this pressure as pastors, which is totally not true, right? None of us have, have it together fully. And pastors especially, I think, have this extended pressure on us um, to, in some ways, pretend. So if we're judging, we ought to judge me just as much as so, uh, here's, here's what's strange about this position, though. In some ways, I think you want me to pretend. No, not that you want me to pretend. You want me to always come with my best foot forward. Here's an example. If I was to come and say, all right, today we're, we're going to open your Bibles because we're going to talk about self-control, right? And before we begin, I would like to thank uh, my deacon, for picking me up at the bar last night because I was just plastered, you know? So thank you, thank you for that. Right? You're welcome. You're, yeah, it's great. I mean, I, I woke up and I was in my bed, I didn't even know what happened, it was great. You'd be like, what, no thank you, I'm not gonna listen to you. So you, we want to listen to people who have integrity in their lives. We want, it, we, and we expect from our pastors uh, I expect from myself, right, to have a life of integrity. Um, but, so, there's this pressure that we have uh, to be this example of consistency. And, um, and, and so, uh, that's the thing, right? Like, we want to make sure that what's going on inside and what we're presenting on the outside are consistent. Here's the thing. Where on earth do we tend to pr pretend the most. In church. What? what? What are you talking about in church? That's right. I mean, if we're being honest with ourselves, I come to church and I look around and we get into Sunday school, I work around the group, and we put our best foot forward in a church. Right? And in some ways, we kind of mask that down a little bit because Oh, well, I go to Twin Cities, and Twin Cities is not the place where we dress up with ties. We actually are real people. We're real. We get into small groups, and we talk, and, and dirt leads, and we're real with each other. Then we go to each other's houses, and we're real with each other, right? Our, yeah. So we have this image of, we're the real church. <laughs> and I wonder if that image is a real image, or if that also is equally a projection of who we think we are or who we wish we were. So I don't want to like, you know, be like, bad church, we're bad people, right? I think we're honestly trying, we're trying to be good. But if we're real, if we're real, real about if we're real, then my guess is that we might see that we're lacking in some areas. We might see that we could be a little better, a lot better than where we currently are, okay? Here's the truth, right? If people don't know what you're really like, then, right, they don't actually really like you. If they don't know what you're really like, then they don't really like you, they just like what you've projected out for them to like. Uh, they like the Facebook you. They like the, oh, I'll come to church you. And I like that. I actually think some of that is like what our retreats are like. I think our Christmas tree is the best. <laughs> I love it. 
And we all come with our best. And that's great, right? But that's a retreat. That's just one time where we can kind of, you know, bring that side of ourselves. And that's okay. But what about the rest of our lives? What about the January of our lives? Where I need to be known for the real me. It's not the Christmas retreat. You know what I mean? It's not the, I come this Sunday and I sit in a row and I make sure that my children, you know, I shush, shush my children so they don't act up. And I make sure that I, you know, come and if, know that people are okay with me. I, I, right? Where is it that I can let my mask down and be known for who I am and not feel judged? <laughs> Here's the, here's the thing, too. It's quite possible that no one actually likes you. <laughs> it is possible that no one likes you because no one actually knows you. Okay? It's mean to say, isn't it? No, Truth is, is that... My wife said, sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like you. Yeah, that's my wife. <laughs> hey, man, we like you, man. Somebody. You heard it here. David likes men. <laughs> um, now we all need to be known for something. We need to be known for something. We want this to be, you know, I want to be known as the wise person, the friendly person, whatever. That's great, but that's not your biggest need. Your, the, the deeper need, the bigger need is not how you're to be known, but that someone knows you. That is the bigger need. That the someones are in your life getting to who you are, the core of who you are, getting to understand what your challenges are, what's going on in your life. We need a place where this manufactured mask can drop. A place without fear of being judged, a place without fear of being rejected. And here's why you know this is true. This is, this is why you already know it's true. Because people will join groups of other people, and if they feel that sense of acceptance and that a sense of love, it doesn't matter if it's a healthy place. It could be the least healthy place, and they will still commit hardcore. Right? It doesn't matter if it's a church or a gang. It doesn't matter if people are living healthy lives or doing drugs. If they feel accepted by that group, they're going to join. They're going to feel at home. They're going to call them family. It doesn't matter. Right? So you already know this is true. You know that, right? This, th that that's what we're longing for. The attractiveness of a place is the acceptance of a place. That's who you call family. The people that really know you or who you are. What do we say about those people? We say, man, those people. Those people are real. They're real people. <laughs> They're real people. Because when you truly know, when people see your faults and struggles and failures, when you've allowed yourself to let that guard down, instead of just getting advice, they put their armor and just say, man, I don't know what to tell you, but we're here for you. We're here for you. That's good. That's the place that you're attracted to. So, we said, unfortunately, the place that churches tend to be, and I'm not going to, you know, be all like bad twin cities. I actually think we're pretty good at this, right? We're pretty good, I think we're a pretty healthy church. But I also think there's a, a, there's a measure of guardedness in this. There's a measure of, I will only allow you in so far, okay? Yeah, come in, but make sure you stay near the front door so I can push you back out. <laughs> I think there's a measure of guardedness with all of us. Um, for a couple reasons. Right? Uh, that guardedness is, um, we don't want to feel rejected. We don't want to, if you, if you really knew who I was, if you really understand what I did, you wouldn't love me. You wouldn't love me. And so we, we guard ourselves. Um, another reason, we don't want to let people down. We don't, want to, we don't want to get so close because maybe you might find that you're trusting me. And I don't want you to trust me. Because I already know myself well enough that I have let you down before. I've let other people down, and Jesus <coughs> already let you down too. And so I'm going to keep my distance from you for your sake. You might think. There's all sorts of reasons, right? That I'm rejected, or you might reject me. 
And then so we just keep each other in the arms linked. So, where should we find this place, right? Where do we find this place of acceptance and love? I think that, and hopefully you think, that this place should be the church, right? And maybe you have found this in the church, in this, this place where, oh, I find that one person here or a small group of people here where I can truly just be known, and that's great. Um, the, the Bible, I think, tells us that this, in fact, is the place where that needs to happen. So the very first church, one of the pastors of the very first church was Jesus' brother, right? James. And James tells us uh, very clearly, you know, if you've read James, right? James is like, let me tell you how it is, black and white, right? No middle ground, this is how it is. And he tells us in, in chapter 5 about one of the qualities of the church and the qualities of our interaction as, as a church. And this is something that... It just seems to be elusive for us as a church, but we need to, to move towards this quality as a people in order to progress as the church of Jesus Christ, okay? Look in chapter five, James chapter five, verse 16. Very familiar passage. It says this, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. It's a, a verse that's stuck in uh, a number of passages around prayer, about having the elders come and pray for the sick and prayer of faith and heal them. But in the middle of it, he takes this time to talk about confession of sin. Confessing of sin, right? So here it says, you know, we want to be, a, I, I talk about having a healthy church, confessing sin. So why don't we stand up, find somebody you don't normally talk to, and for the next five minutes, I want you to confess your deepest, darkest sin to one another. Okay, obviously that's not going to work for you. So, like, why don't we do the other way? Here's the microphone. Come on up. We'll line up this way. You just tell us the deepest, darkest sin. How, is that going to work? All right, see. Here's the thing. The Bible has told us that one of the great qualities of church and one of the most important things we can do is to release ourselves from the thing that holds us back. The thing that we need to pretend that doesn't happen to us, even though we already know what happens in every single one of us. That we're sinners, that we're lost, that we have areas of our lives that are unrepentant. There are areas of our lives that we struggle with. This one thing that the church can help with, we don't know how to do. And is it going to happen right now between, you know, 3.15 and 4 o'clock on a Sunday? No, it never happens. It's Chris, you know, doing his yelling thing at you. <laughs> so we're missing the boat. Somehow we're missing this. It doesn't happen in rows facing forward. But I think it does happen and can happen and should happen. Instead of happening in rows facing forward, it happens in circles. Usually in a coffee shop. Usually in a living room. I mean, sure, we'll open the doors for you if you want to have it here. That's fine. It's not a place to matter, right? What happens, however, is it's usually one or two people who are with you. Two, three, four people in, in a small group. Once you get past seven, it's really hard to confess your sins, <laughs> right? Like, ideal small groups, officially, I guess, are like seven. <laughs> it's with small groups of people, right? It's in these quality places where you're allowed to, you know, Share who you are, what's really going on, and so obviously we're not we're not going to do that uh, here. But if we don't do it, we're going to remain imaginary and pretend. We're just going to come to church and wonder to ourselves: At what point in time will I ever actually get anything real out of church? Yeah. In the Minnesota Post two days ago, there's an article written by a lady. You know, in the, she says this, the, the title of the article says this, the United States could use a minister of loneliness too. That's the title. The first two sentences of the article. 
This week, Britain's Prime Minister, Theresa May, created a new government post, a Minister of Loneliness. The official assigned to this post has been charged with coming up with policies to help Brits combat loneliness, what May called the sad reality of modern life. One survey conducted in 2010 by the AARP, now we're back in America, right? AARP, America, retired from America. America's Association of Americans Retired Persons, found that 35% of the Americans aged 45 and older, approximately 44 million people in America, were chronically lonely, up 20% from just a decade. Then, as in, what are these things in my quotes? Those are not only people living alone, many married people are lonely too. Now married people become lonely sometimes. Listen, we are victims of our own privacy. We are victims of our own, oh, stay away from me, keep at arm's length, I don't want you to really know me. All right, well then no one's really gonna know you. We read a verse like this, confess your sins to one another, and I know what you're thinking. Heck no, I'm not going to let anyone know me. I'm not going to let anyone know what I struggle with. But that's your choice. And the effect is that we have come up with a, you know the effects of chronic loneliness? They're saying that this is a public health disaster. Loneliness has worse effects than obesity. <laughs> And these are people that maybe go to church every week and sit in rows and never are known. That is, it's just so sad. We need to get this right. If we keep up this mask and make sure people think I'm okay, right? Then I must be okay. Listen, no. You're just stuck. So James tells us we need to confess our sins. And what's our response then, right? Verse 16. Let's just take a note of this one verse. Therefore, Confess your sins to one another. There's not enough one anothering going on in church on a Sunday. There is on Friday. Now, you know, we ended up being here. We didn't get the message in time. And we had a great time with um, Ku and um, uh, Na uh, talking about just like, like, let's talk about adulting. Like, young adults, like, what does it take to become an adult? We talked about finances and like renting versus owning. And it was great. It was it was a good, no, it was a good time. You're right, you're not going to say no. <laughs> it was, because I had some great wisdom to impart on her. Um, right? So those one another times, those times where we can get, get into each other's lives are so crucial. And when we do that, and we're able to share with one another and confess with one another, the response of the church is this. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and what? Pray for one another. This is what the healthy church does. It doesn't say confess your sins to one another and then go back to the Old Testament and find the law that says that you're condemned for that sin. Right? It doesn't say come and just spank them on the bottom until they get it right. It doesn't, right? That's not what it says. It says when someone confesses your, their sin to you, you come alongside them and say, brother, sin is tearing you apart. It is hurting you. It is hurting the people you love. And you know what? God has an answer for that. So let's come to our creator, the one who created the laws that show you your sin and how it's destroying you from the inside out and destroying your relationships and destroying what your peace. And let's come to him. And when we come to him and pray to him, you're reminded of how he loves you and how he came to rescue you from sin. Not to show you how bad you are, but how bad sin has, has, has what is done to you. And so that you can be released from its power. And when we pray to him, he comes and he forgives you. He's good and righteous to forgive you from all sin. Amen. He cleanse you, right, from all sin. We pray for one another. So we can be free from the darkness and, and the power that sin has in our lives. That's the response of the church. That's why we have a hope that maybe you come here. Who will know me? Who will love me? Who will bring me to know that God has an answer? 
So, in the meantime, while we sit around waiting for somebody else to do it, right, here's the thing, you know, who's going to do it? Do we need titles for it? Who's going to be the one saying, come, let's, come over to my house, let's chat and have some, you know, let's go out and grab some coffee. How many of there are you and how many of me are me, right? I don't have time to do that with all of you. We need to be, we need to be the ones instigating, we need to be the ones, you know, stepping forward and saying, I'll be the one to, to asking for this. I'll be the one. Here's the thing. Sometimes young people have tried this, and I'm thinking about Dirge. Dirge said, man, let's, we need to get the young people together. Let's go to Jeff and Kathy's house. And it would be so great if we could have these deeper conversations and really get into the word and pray for one another and, and just like, any takers? Right? So here's the thing. Are we going to be a church that actually is a church? Or are we just going to play pretend church for the rest of our time? Until you finally realize, man, they don't have to have it together over there. Somebody, please, somebody, love me. That's what the person right next to you is probably thinking right now. Okay? Somebody love you. All right. So there's extraordinary power in confessing. Right? Um, the, ch the church isn't here to shame you and say you're a bad person. God isn't here to shame you. He's a bad person, right? The law already tells us that. And so Christ came to save us, to bring us out of this so that that damaging destruction of unhealthy life can happen in your life, right? Therefore, confess your sins to one another and, and pray for another, one another. Why? So that you may be healed. So you may be healed. Right? When we confess, when we say, when the power of sin is its secrecy, isn't it? The power of sin is that nobody knows. Oh, well, nobody knows, at least I can keep it a secret, and then people will like me. How about somebody knows and people will like you even more? Because they know you instead of what your image is. Right? Let's finish up with this, a few uh, more things. But Hebrews 10.24 says, And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works. Another one of the one another verses. Let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works. There's not a lot of provoking of love and good works to one another right now. <laughs> Except for me, right? Provoking you. Uh, but the one another part of it isn't happening. That happens again when you get into that coffee shop. And what's your week been like? And how have you blessed somebody today? And how have you blessed your family? And how have you, uh, what are the struggles that are keeping you from being what God is calling you to be? Those conversations. That doesn't happen until we're in one, we're face to face, right? I love, if you were, if you were at the uh, Pastor Laws uh, a celebration yesterday, uh, Chris Reinenson, he's the Twin Cities Metro Baptist Association pastor, he came and he spoke and he, he talked about um, the Lord uh, turned his face towards you. And uh, I've never heard this before. And he, he comes up and he literally, you guys were there, thank you. And he literally like, takes Sifu Nas face and he, like turns it to him. <laughs> it was very awkward and I'm sure a lot of older people were like, what is that? Why are you doing that? <laughs> Um, and, and they're like face to face, and he's like, this is what this means, that there's a friendship and there's an intimacy. That God turns his face towards you. So, so many of us are so like, oh God, I don't want you to turn your face to me, I don't want you to see me, I don't want to be known by, I don't want you to, I don't need to confess this because God, maybe you don't know what's going on in my life, I don't want to reveal it. Oh my goodness, really? God knows everything about you, all right? But God turns his face to you so that you have that intimacy and that, 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 um, that love. It says, let us watch out for one another, provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, one another. And your encouragement to me comes in those small times, in those one-to-ones, and my encouragement likely to you. Paul says this in Galatians 6, if anyone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore them gently. How is the restoring gently ever going to happen if all we're doing is trying to cover for one another and pretend in one another and put up our face in front of one another, right? It only happens when we 
are real, truthful, and there's actual spiritual dis disciplines going on. So, this is what's supposed to happen in church. Romans 15, 7, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. Why does Christ accept you? Why does Christ accept you? Because you're really that awesome? Is everyone here that awesome? It's like, uh, Jesus like, oh my gosh. Yeah, you're so great. I really need to get them on my side because I need them, right? Are you that great? No, of course not. I mean, you're great. <laughs> God, okay. Why does Jesus accept you? Because he's bringing you in to transform you. He doesn't accept you as like, oh, you're so great. Please don't change anything. A good parent accepts their children. It's like, oh, they're part of my family. So that they can grow and mature and get better and wiser. As does God. God accepts you so that he can find that space to transform you and take your heart and move it more towards his and his kingdom work. God wants to transform you, not to keep you the way you are. When we pretend, we put blocks in front of God, in front of others, we put our imaginary selves out there, we reject the work of God's transformational, um, transforming into our hearts of who he wants us to be in the future. God has a direction for your growth. God has a direction for your maturity and your wisdom. So, where are you going to find this godly transformation? Sitting right here. The way that God is going to help to transform us is in those times where we sit together. Remember, right, Joe and Jose and Jeff, when we got together and we were doing small group, that was amazing. And I just, you know, one of my big regrets of 2017 is I wasn't able to pick that up again and do part two. Let's do it in 2018, sound good? Okay. Maybe for, for some of you, right? Uh, what's Miriam and, and Dur and Hua? Do you, do you dread doing prayer time with Zong on Saturday mornings? At what time do you do? Like 8 o'clock in the morning? Who wakes up at 8 o'clock in the morning? Saturday morning right? You're like, oh my gosh, here comes again. 7? 7 7.30, right? Oh, even earlier, right? You're like, oh my gosh, I have to do this. No. I know that, I know, at least for my wife, I speak for my wife, she loves it, she can't wait, she's I she, she could be sleeping in. But no, she, there, there's something precious and transformative about that time. For women's gatherings, right? Thank you, is Joy? Yeah, thank you for hosting mud-based things for the women. I mean, even at those times, there's something fun about that, but hopefully in those times, there's times where people can Take the mask off. <laughs> Take the mask off. Take the mask off. Mixing metaphors. Take the mask off and be real with one another. Men, have you been enjoying men's breakfasts? We've only had two. You're like, I don't know. We've only had two. Right? <laughs> I've been enjoying them. Hopefully we can get to a point where I talk less and you guys talk more. We can get into a space where we're sharing, we're confessing, we're praying for one another. That God can come to our lives and start to transform us from the inside out. <laughs> Guys, our church has an end zone. I had to pull something out. <laughs> Football analogy. Our church has an end zone that we're trying to run to. It's this. Families throughout the Twin Cities progress in faith towards Christ's likeness through a vibrant church. We say it again. Families throughout the Twin Cities progress in faith towards Christ-likeness through a vibrant church. And we will never become a vibrant church if we get if we stay in our rows all the time. And your only Christian experience is in rows and never in circles across the table in pairs. It's Kia putting her small group discipleship together. I'm so happy that you're doing it. We had a little discussion about this a couple weeks ago. She's like, I'm thinking about doing this discipleship thing. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. We need young people, especially some of our young ladies who are new to faith, right? To Kia, I mean, yeah, that's great. Is Kia the perfect person? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. No, we all know she's not a perfect person. But she wants to serve God and she loves people. We know that if you get into Kia's space where she's loving on you through discipleship, that is a good place to be. Right? Right, Lily? She knows that. It's, um... Uh, it's the discipleship groups we're doing. It's the small groups that we're doing. It's Sunday school that we're doing. What are you doing to put yourself in a place where God can transform you? Okay? Whatever we're doing, it's a good start. But it's not enough. 
Because if I was going to ask you guys, how many of you guys have confessed your sin in one way or another in the last month? Hands? Two? Three? Four? Five? All right. That's good. I was going to expect you none. But, <laughs> but it's not enough. How many of you have you said, I've spurred one another on to loving good deeds in the past month? Hands? One? <laughs> Even less. <laughs> you get my, bit, my, my point? If you're coming and saying, my, well, my Christian experience is just to hear, and maybe I'll hear something good, and I'm going to learn, and I'll be a little bit entertained while it happens. You don't get it. You don't get church. You're here to love and serve and bring the blessing of God to everyone around you. Come and be a blessing to the person next to you. Spur them on to love and good deeds. Accept one another as Romans well says. You know, right? Don't give up in the habit of meeting. Not just this is not even a meeting. This is not a meeting. This is me talking at you. Okay, encouraging you. What? Find time in your schedule right now. Open up your phones right now and look at time in your schedule. And like, mm, yeah, I've got some time. And, and think about I'm going, I'm going to call someone up this week. Hey, are you free at X Y Z time? Let's talk. Okay, Pastor Chris, you know, it's weird. I've never done this before, but Pastor Chris is like, you should do this because we want to grow in a, a church where families out of the Twin Cities progress in, in faith towards Christ like this a vibrant church. And he said that we want to be a vibrant church, so let's get this thing going. Amen? Amen. Somebody, somebody do this, this Amen. thing. We need to be better connected, and you need to stop waiting for me to tell you when to do it. Okay? I'm not your dad. I'm just another guy. <laughs> okay. I am. Um, you need to start. Find two other people, three other people, identify a place, just start. And if you need support, let me know. Maybe I'll give you a list of questions to start with. Maybe you can have a, a conversation around what we talked about today. Whatever it is, I don't care. But just get in that place where, where you're not just like, okay, this is like school. It's not school. This is church. It's God's, it, it's God's strategy to reach the world. And save the world. You're saying. Uh, it's gonna. I, I challenge some of you to confess your sins one to another. Some of us need freedom. And we wanted so much the church to give it to us, or, or to find it from 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 the church that God would give us it to us through the church. And we just need someone to come along with <coughs> us and help us. Okay? Um, if we do this. We're going to see progress towards faith, uh, towards a faith of, like Christ, Christ-like faith, uh, and create a vibrant church. We're going to see that in our church. We're going to see healing in our lives. We're going to see restored relationships. We're going to see restored, maybe physical healings. Maybe we're going to see that happen, and God actually moving in our hearts and becoming the type of church that He's called us to. Let me pray over you. Uh, do we have the worship team? Do we have the we do. While I'm coming up, let me pray over you for courage to do that, and for obedience to do that. And uh, and honestly, I know, I know, I know some of you right now, God is like, you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, I need to do this. Yeah, you do need to do this. Identify that one person who's two people you need to call to this week and say, be the church together and start. Heavenly Father, I pray for our congregation and our people. Lord, um, we spend so much time thinking that we're safe behind a wall of what we want people to know about us. We've set up this image of ourselves, and maybe if just that's enough. If people just know us by that, and that's enough, but then people don't really know me. God, Lord, tear down that wall. That's not the real church. That's not the real person. We need to progress and tra be transformed into godliness. We need to be transformed into, into likeness like you. And Lord, you've given us the strategy of the church. There's people sitting right next to us that can do it with us. And Lord, I just yearn for a place where it's so life, life is happening here, here so much. That we just are so attracted to it. We just, we don't need you know, to put on a falsehood. We don't need to put on an imaginary Chris anymore that I can be fully known and fully loved and fully accepted. Not so I can stay there, but so that I can begin to mature and grow towards Christ's likeness. 
Lord, give us the courage. Give, give us our church. There's people here today, right now, that need to have the courage to say, Lord, okay, I'm ready to do this. I'm stepping out. I'm going, stepping out of faith. I'm going to call them up and say, let's get together. Let's just have a chat and begin to be the church of Jesus.
sets all things straight, to which every other stone aligns. It's the one that, that sets us on our, the right foundation. And so Christ, as we think about you, Jesus, as we think about what you are, I pray that we could come to you and think about come praying to you, that we may be healed, we come to you with our, our weaknesses and our failures, and you turn that from, from curse into blessing, from weakness into strength. We should not be afraid of who you are, but we should come boldly before the throne of God, uh, looking for, uh, for redemption and forgiveness, and finding it, finding it because the blood of Jesus has covered all sins, and we are known as children of God, that we are white as snow, we come to you.